What up, guys? Welcome to today's podcast. Today, we're going to answer a question and talk about the difference between essentially what separates a white belt technique from a black belt technique, right? You know, again, the the idea and the question we'll dive into here in just a minute is uh, essentially how can a black belt use a technique that a that they, you know that every white belt knows and still do really well at the highest level of jiu-jitsu. So that's going to be kind of the focus of today's podcast. Um, and we'll talk about what separates those techniques, and we'll also talk about what you could do to potentially make that happen or what you can do with your training in order to um, facilitate that process to developing your techniques to be that black belt level. Big thanks for our sponsors for helping make the podcast happen. Charles Webb CBD. Charles Webb CBD is one of the premier CBD companies out there. Uh, they're third party tested, which means they have an independent company coming in, testing their products. Many of you may not know this. A lot of companies do not do that. Uh, they don't sort of make their products go through the scrutiny of testing. They just put it out there. There are companies that do. Uh, Charlotte Webb is, uh, Charlotte's Webb is one of them. And again, it's a great tool for recovery. It's a great supplement for recovery. It can help manage stress, help with uh, improving sleep cycles, all that stuff, stuff that's very important for the recovery. And as you guys, a lot of you guys that are listening to this are 30 or older, the older you get, the more that recovery becomes important. And again, it's just a nice tool to have in the toolbox, a nice supplement to have. I typically take mine at nighttime with my sleep routine. I know Eugene takes his a little bit in the morning to sort of give him like a level headed, some chillness throughout the day. And again, you can test it out for yourself and try it out. They have a lot of different products, everything from balms for sore muscles to tinctures that you take like an eyedropper. They have THC free version. So if you're someone that gets tested and you're worried about it, they have that kind of product for you. Do your research, of course, to see what kind of testing you're um, you're put to. Uh, but it could be an answer for that. But again, check it out at charlesweb.com. The promo code, if you guys want to save 20%, is jujitsu20. Also, thanks to our sponsor, Epic Roll, epicrollbjj.com. Guys, they have a new set of shorts out. So Matt sent us a pair of shorts a while ago. Um, and I got to try them out, put them on and, uh, take them for a spin. And I like them now the, what's different about them is they're shorter. So some of you may not like that, right? You might, you might like the regular shorts that they have, which have a longer, um, inseam leg length, longer inseam. That's it. It's right. Um, but they have the, the normal, uh, the normal elastic band, which I prefer over the Velcro that typically goes, goes crappy after about a year or so you know then you mm -hmm. have like shorts that have no rips or tears in them but then the velcro wears out but the new shorts are a little shorter and i like that you know again for moving around and then again if you if you don't skip leg day and you've got a little leg muscle maybe you want to show it off that's cool too but either way if you guys want to check them out go to epicrollbjj.com and when you go to their website look for the epic grappling shorts 2.0 uh, again you'll see them they have a little bit shorter of an inseam and I find them very comfortable and I like them. And if you like to wear some shorter shorts with your rash guard, check them out. Use the promo code jujitsu for 15% off. Also, if you guys would like to support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the jujitsu podcast. Upon joining the uh, Patreon, you'll be supporting the podcast and you'll be getting an ad-free version of the podcast. And then along with that, you'll be getting access to our uh, exclusive library where we have everything from uh, seminars that I've recorded, warm-up routines that Dr. Eugene here has put together with his physical therapy knowledge and his jiu-jitsu knowledge, as well as a little snippet from each guest that we've had on the podcast delivering some useful idea for your jiu-jitsu training that you can take action on today uh, and you get all of that at a very inexpensive price so if you'd like to check it out patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast give it a look last but not least guys if you would like to get my daily email you can do so by going to my website at jujitsu.net slash join c-h-e-w-j-i-t-s-u dot net slash join upon joining you'll get access to uh, three separate ebooks that are all on different ideas of training. One's on building your game plan. One is teaching you how to break through training plateaus through deliberate training, which we're going to talk about deliberate training a little bit more here in just a second. Uh, and the other one is some at home strategies for training during time off breaks, whatever it might be. And again, you get access to all three of those. And then you'll get my daily email, which again, I go into everything from philosophical ramblings to training ideas to just random things that are going on with traveling or even exclusive offers that I have. So you get access to all that at jujitsu.net slash join.
let's get into this question today from a self-proclaimed spazzy white belt. He says, Chewy, the highest percentage submissions in upper upper level competitions are nearly always the most basic submissions, uh, i.e. arm bars, kimuras, triangles, etc. Can you explain what the difference is between a master and a novice using the same technique? I'm failing to understand how upper level belts get caught in the most basic submissions. Shouldn't their defense be strong enough at the higher levels not to fall for these? Thanks in advance. Signed, Spazzy White Belt. So it's a pretty good question. Um, I could probably write a book on this because, again, this is, uh, for me, as a guy who I pride myself on using pretty basic jiu-jitsu, pretty simple stuff, this is something that I like. I like being able to use jiu-jitsu that I learned as a white belt against black belts in competitions and still use it effectively. Uh, so this is something that, you know, again, I'm um, I'm a big fan of. To um, get you to chew on an idea, there is an idea from the book Breathe by Hicks and Gracie. And there's a part of it. I'll quote it for you real quick. He says, quote, the invisible aspects of jujitsu, like the sense of touch, weight, momentum, and physical connection to your opponent are very difficult to teach. This is not rational, intellectual knowledge that one can learn from a lecture or a book, only thousands of hours of training. And uh, so, you know, as you're putting in this time in training, Yes, you're learning these technical aspects, you're learning concepts, you're learning all this stuff, right? But your body's adapting, your muscles begin to change, right? Like Eugene would tell you that, you know, certain muscles in jiu-jitsu will become super tight and strong, other muscles don't get enough work. So there's these muscle muscular imbalances that are created, um, but also the your circuitry in your brain and body are beginning to change as the circuitry begins to adapt to the stimulus that it's being presented with. If you're doing something over and over and over again, you can think of it this way. Your body essentially prepares itself for having to do those tasks over and over again. Mm -hmm. This is why if there's something that you do on a regular basis, it becomes easier and easier, right? So that same thing's happening. And so what happens a lot of times is as you develop these changes in your brain and your body, you develop this hypersensitivity that can detect the slightest variations in movement, you know, where you know if the technique is correct. Likewise, you know if there's a slight like movement from your opponent and they're off balance, whatever it might be. And it's something you can read about, but like Hickson says, it isn't something that's you can learn from a lecture. It's not intellectual knowledge. Uh, it doesn't make sense until you feel it for yourself. Like you, like you can hear me talking to you and you can be like, oh, okay, I get it. But until you feel it, you don't really get it. And you can think about this as the same as a, a musician or a craftsman. You know, you give a person, a, like I give a master musician a uh, an instrument, give a master craftsman their tools, and they can make you beautiful music or they can make you uh, a beautiful piece of work, right? Like some, uh, they can make you a home or a table or whatever it might be. You give me those same things and I probably won't be able to give, make you anything. Right. It's not the tools or the instruments that are such a big deal. Right. You could give me like a a, a, a fifty thousand dollar guitar and I'm not going to be able to play you good music. You know, it's again, it's not the thing. It's the person wielding the thing that's mm -hmm. important. And. On a more boring technical side, through trial and error, you start to figure out all these slight variations that work for you, right? Because, again, many of my best te techniques, for instance, happen from attempting them in training, failing, changing my grips and body positioning, failing, doing it again and again. And then at some point it works and you find something that works for you. And a lot of times when your coach gives you a technique, it might work a little bit, but eventually you're going to have to morph or at least uh, adjust and create variations for yourself and you figure that out through trial and error right um and so again in my bearded experience every time i come back and spend a little bit more time focused on even the most basic positions i still find new stuff i still find new ways to set it right like we've been doing half guard at the gym recently that's been our focus and even in that position i've spent thousands of hours in half guard it's one of my best positions and i'm still finding new stuff I'm still finding new adjustments um, to wrap this up. And then we'll jump into it with Eugene. One of the biggest factors for developing a technique into a black belt technique to the chagrin of some of the internet types telling you there's magics and shortcuts and hacks that you can put in, right? It's about putting in hours, hours and hours of effort, developing these movements. We'll talk about different ways you can do that. Um, but again, it's about putting in that time. 
And there's different ways that you can speed up that process to some degree, but no matter what, the reason why we look at these black belts using these really basic techniques and we look at it with such awe is because it's remarkable, right? It, it, it's, it's worth remarking about, right? It's remarkable. It's rare. And it's only rare because it's not, it doesn't happen all the time. And why is that? Because it's freaking hard. It takes a long time. It takes a lot of focus. And those aren't things that can be circumvented. You can't shortcut your way through that. You can't hack your way through that. That's called tons of effort and good training. And so, you know, that's an idea to chew on. What, what, what separates those, again, it's not necessarily the technique, but it's the person using the technique. And then the way that they find the little adjustments that they're going to use is through hours and hours and hours of trial and error. And uh, again, reflection of figuring out what happens with it and how to uh, improve it. Yeah, I think a lot of it's um, as you go through those reps and and hours and hours of, of, of practice, you refine the technique. And I think um, let's share another uh, definition or like a quote. This is from... Um, Anders Ericsson. Uh, so, and for, for you guys that are listening, Dr. Anders Ericsson, I'm a big fan of his work. And if you um, if you read about him, he's the guy. So like when you see the 10,000 hour rule mm -hmm. or when you hear the idea of deliberate practice, he was the guy that sort of pioneered that those studies that were done to figure that stuff out. Um, by the way, he doesn't really, it's not 10,000 hours. That's not really the rule. Yeah. Um, there's maybe some level of competency there. He actually thinks it's like much, much higher, like m far more hours than that. Um, and it has to be very focused training. It just can't be like, you know, you're in the gym screwing around a little bit. That's not training. Right. 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 Um, and so, but again, good work. If you want to check out one of his books, a really good book by him, um, that he, uh, co-authored was, uh, peak. Um, and so again, mm -hmm. I've got that sucker and it's earmarked and written up through tons of good stuff. If you're a coach, I would really recommend getting yeah. it because it would give you some really useful ideas on training. Sorry, go ahead now. No, cool. <laughs> so uh, he talks about deliberate practice. And so he's a psychologist, um, you know, and he talks about the, it's quote, the individualized training activities, specially designed by a coach or teacher to improve specific aspects of an individual's performance through repetition and successive refinement. So like. You know, I, I think it's just basically when we're doing this, this stuff, uh, in these, these movements, it's problem solving, you know, we're mm -hmm. basically trying to figure out what doesn't work, throw that away, get the stuff in that does work and, and just kind of refine and almost like trim the fat, so to speak, just get it smoother and more efficient and, um, maybe no wasted movements, no wasted, um, energy no wasted movements everything all your energy all your muscle contractions everything is in this beautiful sequence and um a beautiful kind of pattern that you know makes when i see like these simple moves like a hodger gracie doing mm -hmm. a very basic collar choke or something and not and that's not basic it's very high level um but it looks simple but it's you know when it's done and it's made to look so simple and effortless that's how you know it's a technique that's very refined. And that's one of those things because it looks smooth. It looks mm -hmm. just like it's just not – he's not doing a lot of work. And there's a lot of work. You know, it's like the the iceberg, you know. You see the iceberg and, like, there's all this mm -hmm. work, the giant iceberg underneath the water and the tiny little bit just peeking out through the top of the water. It's all that work that went into it just makes that that technique work. Well, right, and that's the thing. Uh, there was an interview with Hodger, and, you know, he, you could kind of tell – that he was kind of peeved a little bit because, you know, he says, Oh, people say my game is so basic, this, that, whatever yeah. he said, what, what's, what's more impressive than being able to beat the best black belts in the world with the simplest techniques. And I mean, like when you think about it, when you go back, like I, I was, a, I was watching jujitsu at this time in 2009, when Hodger had his famed, uh, Math, his famed world's championship run and submitted four guys i think it was with mounted x chokes like we were sitting around watching it going what the hell like how how is this happening because you don't see black belts get submitted with mounted x chokes very often it's very rare and so for all of us to watch it we're watching white belt jiu-jitsu 101 used at the highest level by one of the best jiu-jitsu practitioners you're just sitting there going damn that's mm -hmm. impressive. You know, like when you watch like when you watch a really good black belt roll with a black belt who's at another level, right? And you watch how the black belt can toy with them and you know that other black belt's good, but then they get toyed by him with this person. 
it it boggles your mind sometimes that that's even possible but we, obviously it is and you got to think there's just these small fractions of a second difference as far as their movements going and they're just slightly timed a little bit better and their techniques just a little bit sharper but it makes all the difference in the world right mm -hmm. And it's so impressive to see that stuff. Yeah. It, and again, like that happens through all that work. Yeah. They set these, it's almost like they're setting these traps. Like I, I'll roll with one of our guys, Mark. Mark's a black belt. Very good. Has a very tough half guard. I feel like I play a similar game to him. He just plays it better than me. And like I can, when we roll, I can feel him setting the traps. Like he knows I'm going to place my hand here. He's anticipating this thing. And then he's going to take my arm or do whatever he does. Um, and I think those, elite level um athletes or you know jujitsu practitioners like Hodger Gracie already knows what you're gonna do before you do it, you know, based on what he he feels and senses. I think he does based on yes he's like, no. I know well here's hear me out here. So I think like the setups and the grips. He knows that if he has a certain grip position, you're gonna respond in a certain way most of the time, not always to try to break that grip or readjust your posture, whatever that is. And then you're going to the off balancing piece of it based on those grips and then it, it kind of it's like a downward it's like a spiral out of control um you know for you as a if you're the one on the receiving end yeah and i think you know i can't speak for hodger but i mean for me i can tell you that there's two different ways this happens one is yes yeah, sometimes you're you're basically going down almost like a checklist because you're you outclass the person enough that you can actually think pretty well and you're just thinking about what you're going to do next and they're giving you the response mm. you're looking for and you're going through it that happens sometimes what's more common in like say like a, a hard hard competitive role or a competition is a lot of times it's you've done this thing so much that you have all these different responses but the responses aren't necessarily you're not thinking about it right you're going off of feeling right you you, you have become jujitsu at this point and your body is res responding to the feeling of what's going on right you have a, a an intelligence we, we don't think about it this way but we have an intelligence in our body that exists right and so it's not just like yes there's intellectual head knowledge right but um you know you think about all the things that you do with your body and how you move around and uh, especially with humans we do all kinds of crazy things. Like I was thinking about this the other day. I was driving. And as I'm driving, it's like me and this car have become one because I'm driving and I'm able to think about random stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know where the car is in, in space, right? When we're rolling in jujitsu, you become real. Like if you wear a gi on, for instance, you become one with that gi. You know where all the fabric is. You know exactly what's going on. And then likewise in jujitsu, if you're rolling with someone and let's say it's no gi, you become one with that person in their body, right? You and this other person are locked up in this human pretzel and you get so sensitive to everything. Like for instance, um, like this morning, for instance, I could, uh, one of my uh, students was being my uke and I was having him put me in a position and without looking, I said, hey, unlock your legs and put your other leg over top. I just feel it. I know exactly where his body positioning is in relation to mine because I've done this stuff so much. And so a lot of times in the middle of those roles, again, I've talked about this analogy numerous times. Um, a friend of mine, he was a pretty good guitar player. And I remember watching him play the guitar and just, I mean, just going up and down the, the uh, what is that thing called? Fret the fret. What's that? neck fret yeah they're going fret. up and down the neck yeah yeah going up and down the neck just playing chords and stuff like that and just playing this crazy riff and i was asking i was like you know like how do you know which one to go to next right because again it's like just like in jiu-jitsu well how do i know what to do next what's the next mm -hmm. step and i was asking him i was like well how do you know what to do next he's like i don't know i'm just feeling it out it feels good mm -hmm. it feels right because what happened was he did this for so long that he went one here 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 and then he's done that so much that now he has that that intuition, that sensitivity, right. that invisible musicianship, if you will, he just knows what's going to sound good. Um, it's like jazz musicians. They talk about this all the time. Like a big part of jazz is improv improvisation. So again, they spend a lot of time mastering the music. It's like, you know, uh, Charlie Parker said, you master the instrument, master the music, and then you forget all that shit and you just play music. You you do all that time spending mastering these these specific things, and then what ends up happening is at a certain point when you're engaged in this situation, you're no longer thinking about it. You're just going off of the feel, and there are times where you think, but I think in a lot of cases with jiu-jitsu, if you're up against people that are comparatively skilled, 
you know, and you can't just outclass them. You're going at such a fast pace. There's not time to think, but you're going off mm -hmm. of the feeling. And because you've done this particular technique or position so much, you just know where everything is and you're just, it's muscle memory, right? Right. That kind yeah. Of and idea. I think you, that, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Like you kind of already anticipate what they're going to do and you kind of feel what they're going to do. You already know. And I think true mastery comes when um, you're able to account for all these variables. Like maybe they don't put their hand in the exact spot you want or do something. You're able to account, you're able to modify and kind of on the, on the fly readjust it's like when um you know sometimes i'll roll with like white or blue belts and i can mm -hmm. see they're really thinking about what they're going to do next and like sometimes i'll just like i'll close my eyes or i'll like i may not even be focused on exactly like the role i'm, I'm still like i'm not focused on what i'm doing yeah like i don't feel like i'm mentally working hard like i'm i'm feeling it out I'm going based on like their body reactions and my and my movements and where I feel them move. And I think that's once you do it long enough, like you said, like I can. For me, for example, physical therapy, I can start to see how someone moves or their movement patterns or even how they and I can kind of start to figure out what's wrong, like what's not working properly. It's kind of like I have an intuition now based on your mechanics of your body or how your body's moving. I can almost anticipate what is going on i think that we see a lot of that in jujitsu as well like when we're kind of you know done it long enough you start to anticipate and feel what the other person how they're going to move and where they're going to move and you already know what you're going to do and your body almost starts to move in that position to kind of meet them at that area right exactly and, and so again in what i guess my thing is is a lot of times people because we live in such a heady society right like mm -hmm. where we're I mean, you know, you think about all the people, like everybody's trying to sound smart. Everybody's trying to talk about stuff. And what I'm, what I just want to make sure it's clear is like, yes, that that's a part of it. Having the head sure. knowledge is very, very good, right? That it can help steer you in the right direction. But all of that stuff doesn't really mean much if it's not become like body knowledge, right? If you don't have the muscle memory built, if you don't have the the musculature to support those movements, think about going into jujitsu for the first time and how sore you get. It's working out muscles you don't normally work out. Uh, my buddy Joe, who's incredibly strong, right? The guy friggin' throws up, you know, like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds, right? Like over his head. Like I've seen him almost go to like 375 or something over his freaking head and stuff. It's crazy. Mm. But he was watching me one day lifting someone up essentially with my hip flexor, right? And he's like, Jesus Christ. He's like, you've got this 250 pound guy hanging in the air with your hip flexor. Now that's not a muscle that like he could do. He wouldn't be that strong because he hasn't adapted to it, right? Yeah. Just like with his Olympic lifting, he's had all these muscle adaptations that again, even if I was strong, doesn't mean I could do those same things because again, I hadn't been, I haven't strengthened myself in that particular way. And so again, mm -hmm. I, what I'm, what I want to make sure it's clear is like a lot of times we want to know like what's the heady thing that you can tell me, in order to like make this thing better. And sometimes there are specific things that your coach can look at or someone can pick out for you. That's a thing. But a lot of times it comes down to, you know, it's something in your body. So like when you're making these adjustments on the fly, when you're going off of feeling, these are things that are just happening in your body. They're not necessarily like you're not sitting going down your 10 point checklist mm -hmm. in your head before you pull the trigger. You're just going because again, you feel that it's the right thing to do because you've been doing this so much. And this happens to everybody in jujitsu, even for you guys that are relatively new white belts, you will notice that you start, you start, doing things and you don't even realize you're doing it like you'll start mm -hmm. pulling back from people in a certain way because what here's like here's an example if you get arm barred enough from guard or any position you will start to become really hypersensitive to the back of your tricep you'll if someone starts to grab your arm you will begin to pull your arm back you'll start to pull your arms in it just happens like i can watch my newer white belts pick that up very quickly now why would you do that well because you begin to associate subconsciously you may get it you may get it consciously but even subconsciously you realize that when person grabs back of arm i get arm barred i lose so therefore pull away when person grab back of arm you know and and a lot of a lot of what we go off of in and this is something i think is really important when you're learning techniques you want to try to pinpoint the physical cues because a lot of techniques have a physical cue and by physical cue i mean a feeling like a feeling that says oh 
that's the feeling that tells me to execute this particular technique, right? And if you can pinpoint those, it gives you one, the ability to know when to go for the technique and have better timing, right? But it also then gives you the ability to defend those techniques. Because if you know the physical cue is X or Y, then you know that, well, when they do X or Y, you you're, you have to defend that technique. And again, that's a feeling thing. We can know it. I could tell you, hey, when someone grabs the back of your tricep, pull your arm back. But until you start to feel that for yourself, right? Then in, that's when it becomes real. And again, that's the beautiful part about jujitsu. Jujitsu is not a, it's not a head knowledge thing. It's partly a head knowledge thing. Mm -hmm. That's a part of it, but it's far more an execution thing, a body thing, an action thing, because we are focused on the reality of the situation. It's why you can't have like a black belt, just go watch an instructional regurgitate it and then teach it to the students. They they have to do it themselves, yeah. even if they're just drilling it and practicing it so they can get a feel for the technique in order for them to show it. Yeah. And then going back to that technique, Joe does Olympic lifting. Yeah. You know, Joe is very, very strong. Someone mm -hmm. that's equally as strong as Joe may not be able to lift the way that he lifts or perform some of these lifts because he's got the proper technique and the timing. Right. You know, Joe may be his hip flexors may be as strong as yours, or he may be able to lift the same amount of weight, but your ability to position yourself, move your opponent where you need them or your training partner and get your legs in the right position and kick the right muscles into gear when they need to be. That's the difference, right? Doesn't mean like it, it's just your I, I watch Joe lift and mm -hmm. i watch sometimes i'll watch these olympic lifts in slow motion and i watch how the bar just kind of seems like it floats in one spot yeah basically and stops and, gets and they get underneath yeah, it of it yes it's so incredible but that takes such incredible timing and turning on muscles and kind of shutting not purely shutting off but like getting your body to start yeah. to move in the right sequence and that's the thing with like jujitsu or setting up a position you're setting someone up with these sequences and these movements and you're feeling where they're going to be and then you're getting yourself in the right position to catch that arm or catch that arm bar or whatever that is mm -hmm. and i think like you know we can talk about kind of breaking down a technique and what you do and how you learn it best um but you know it all starts like you were talking about say you guys are working half guard it all starts in like all right let's start talk about the entry you know you got to get the entry in because if you don't have the proper entry proper grips or the grips that you want, you're not going to get into that position at all. You have no chance at all. So um, let, let's talk about that, Chewy. Let's talk about maybe like learning techniques or breaking down techniques. Okay. How do we develop those black belt techniques? And again, these are from, you know, my opinions and training and stuff like that. So take that for what you will. Um, there's some interesting stuff on that, right? So first off, the big thing is that like hard work is great, but training hard isn't always the answer, right? Like you could battle it out on the mat, have a super hard rolling session. It'll be fun and it's very necessary at times. And that's great. But when we're talking about developing skills and techniques, training really, really hard generally isn't the fastest way to get better. You know, it's a way to get in shape. It's a way to improve in certain areas. But when you're talking about developing a specific skill or technique, there's different ways to go around it. Um, there's a quote from uh, the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. Um, I'll read it off. He says, quote, scientists increasingly believe the answer includes myelin, a layer of fatty tissue that grows around neurons, acting like an insulator that allows the cells to fire faster and cleaner. To understand the role of myelin and improvement, keep in mind that skills, be they intellectual or physical, eventually reduce down to brain circuits. This new science of performance argues that you get better at a skill as you develop more myelin around the relevant neurons, allowing the corresponding circuits to fire more effortlessly and effectively. To be great at something is to be well myelinated. Um, mm -hmm. And so, again, it's just an idea to think about because, right, when we talk about muscle memory, what does that even mean, muscle memory? We're talking about the we're talking about the friggin' thing in our brain fires. It says do X, Y, and Z, recruit all these muscles and do this task. And as we do something more and more and more, obviously we get better at it. We all understand this. This is something that everyone intuitively just knows, right? Well, why is it happening? Well, again, the the theory is the science is right now that as we do these things, that brain circuitry is getting stronger, cleaner, and more effective at what it's doing. And so again, your body begins to adapt, not just in a physical way with the muscles and everything else, but also in that brain way um, that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So again, as a coach, you can help support this, right? By 
focusing one on less technique, right? A lot of times as coaches, guys, they want to, they have so many techniques in their, in their friggin' little treasure trove of stuff and they just want to dish them out. Um, but that's not always going to be the best thing, right? Because for instance, when I was at the, um, this has happened numerous times at seminars. Um, I've been to camps and this has happened. I tend to focus on very little. Um, I focus on one or two things and just, that's what we're doing. We're going to get a lot of work in with those things. And what's interesting is I've gotten a lot of people telling me, man, this is the best seminar I've ever been to because I remember what we just did. Or I remember at the, um, the origin camp. Again, I can't speak for everybody. I only have my experience, but I had more than two dozen people come up to me over the course of that week and tell me, oh man, I just hit that arm bar you just showed me. Dude, that was great because we did the arm bar every single day that we trained. I was like, we, you're going to do the same. We're going to get reps with it every single day. I'm not going to jump around. You're going to do the same move. And like the last day, the very last roll that I watched on the mat, uh, Jocko's daughter hit the arm bar. She came mm -hmm. up and gave me a high five. I was like, hell yeah. Because again, that's the idea. Well, I don't need to give you more. I need to give you something and let you work with it so you can get it down. That's what's important. So I, you know, one of the things I think that sometimes we do a disservice to our students with, if we do it this way, I don't do it this way. I used to though, is when we try to smash a bunch of techniques into a class and the student only gets maybe, you know, three or four minutes, five minutes to practice. They do it one or two or three times. Then it's like, we're moving on to the next movement. That's not nearly enough time to play with that technique and to figure it out. Um, also like throughout the course of like, let's say we've been doing half guard for the course of a month. Like we're going over the same damn sweeps over and over again, the same entries over and over again. And what's happening is people are getting really comfortable with the position. They've had a lot of time to play with it. It, it feels normal to them. Um, it feels effortless to them. They're not struggling anymore. And so that's great because again, what's, what is it? What's better? I show them, you know, 20 techniques over the course of a month. They don't remember anything, or I show them maybe, you know, three or four, and they can actually remember them when we, when we're done with this month of training. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, I think as coaches, we can do better by our students by one, giving less techniques, focusing more time to actually drill those techniques and practice them, get reps in. And then, you know, again, when you're focusing on rolling, it doesn't just have to be hard rolling. Again, I like full rolling, so we do plenty of that. Um, but also focusing on specific situational rolling. This could be positional rolling, such as, you know, passing a half guard and sweeping from the half guard. But it could also be like shortened down even more so. So you could say like with our half guard, uh, a lot of times when it comes to half guard, the battle is the underhook. If I get the underhook, I'm I'm using half guard. If you get the underhook on me, you're controlling me from half guard. And so, you know, we've done rounds where it's focusing on just getting the underhook. Whoever gets the underhook wins, right? And then go back to that. And again, doing those things gives you more time to focus on these specific skills that you're trying to develop in people and giving them a really focused area um, to develop opposed to just saying, okay, we're going to do a full roll now. Maybe you get a chance to use this stuff. Maybe you don't, whatever happens. And so that's one. Mm -hmm. For students, it's a little different, right? Obviously, if you don't control your training, then you try to squeeze in whatever type of drilling time you can. Um, but when it's time to roll, you can still do a lot of focus with your specific training. This is something that that ebook that's on my website at uh, jujitsu.net slash join the email uh, list that I have. I give that away for free and it gives you ideas on this, right? So, but one of them is when you get on the gym, go to the gym, when you're rolling, you need to be focused on specifically working on a position or a technique or something. Again, if you don't have control of your training, then you need to make sure that you put some deliberate focus on your training during the day. So let's say, for instance, if you were trying to play half guard. Okay, great. When you're rolling with someone, only use half guard to sweep from the bottom. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's been times where I've tried to work on my escapes. I'll play guard everything else and I'll kind of let the person pass when they get around to side control, then I'll start defending and it gives me a chance to defend, but you want to be very deliberate because again, it's really hard to know if you're progressing, if you don't know what you're chasing. Right. And then after you are doing that, you have to reflect back on what you just did because there is no improvement without some reflection. Again, you'll, you'll eventually get to a stopping point. You have to be able to reflect back on what you're doing and say, why do I think this didn't work or why did this work or whatever and kind of think about that sort of thing. But um, those are a few ideas to, to consider. Yeah, I think um, so doing a seminar. For a seminar, a lot of times it's a unique situation because you may not go – classes aren't – you're not doing techniques for two 
sometimes three hours. You're like maybe doing them for like 45 minutes to an hour. And then you're, but when you're going to a seminar, you're like, you're very excited. You want to learn this stuff. However, after a certain amount of time, your capacity to learn starts to dwindle and your ability to really focus and have cleaner techniques starts to decline. So I mm -hmm. think that when you're fresh and you learn this technique, right, you learn a little stuff. And then even if you're starting to get a little more mentally tired, but you're still drilling, you can still get some benefit because okay. you're still getting the reps. You've kind of, you know, done the, the mental work and now you have to do kind of the physical side of it to start to kind of get the, get that, uh, those patterns in line. So mm -hmm. I think when, when you do a seminar, when we went to the jujitsu camp, uh, or, or the jujitsu seminar, uh, the retreat in Costa, in Costa Rica, Rica, we did yeah. the same stuff, same stuff. And for me, like I've seen this before, but I learned, I've seen this shotgun armor before, but I learned about the shotgun armor and it was from different ways from repping it. From being the uke being underneath you you know and getting arm barred over and over uh i learned i could feel what you were doing too you know like oh here's his positioning here's his body weight is and this and that and just over time it, it solidified that and i was able to utilize that technique and then i was like it's fresh in my head and i can use it so i think that you you can get more out of it by doing less obviously and you're also getting more reps right if you're doing the same technique for a long period of time you get more reps and um, one thing that we've started doing, um, we used to do this some before, but we talked about it, the designated winter drills. Yep. I think I like those a lot um, just because you're starting to get, and that takes some good effort from your partner. You have to good training partner for this because they have to give you, they can't just flop around and not do anything. Yeah. And that designated winter drills are basically the person, say we're working half guard, we're going for underhooks. You're going to get the underhook. We're going to allow it. However, we're not going to get there just like by flopping around and letting you get it without any resistance. We're going to give you some real resistance. We're going to make you work for it, but you're going to get that underhook eventually if you kind of do some of the right stuff. So it's it's a limited amount of resistance, mm -hmm. kind of combining a little bit more of the active drilling model, I think, in that capacity, which I think is very helpful to just to feel reactions and, and kind of normal or kind of typical kind of uh, resistance. Right, because think about if you were going to, I mean, just think of it this way. If we go into the gym and we're lifting weights and we want to bench press 300 pounds, um, and right now we can only bench press 100 pounds, what we're saying is that there is an issue with the amount of intensity and the resistance that we have on the bar, right? The resistance with the weight that we can't deal with yet. So how do we deal with that? Well, we slowly work up with increasing amounts of resistance until yeah. we can. And so it's the same idea with your drills, right? When you say, okay, I can do this technique somewhat, like when I'm drilling it, but then when I roll, it falls apart. Well, all we're saying is the intensity of that roll places too much resistance on you for it to be effective. Your technique and your muscle memory and everything else is not in place enough to withstand that. So what do we do? You can figure out ways to increase the resistance over time. Um, in different ways to allow that. So you could start with things like, for instance, with half guard. Okay, you start with just underhook drills, just getting the underhook. And you could do a designated winner style um, where the person is eventually going to get the underhook. But again, the other the, the top person, like you said, is being a good partner and they understand that their goal in this drill is to help their training partner down below. It's the drill for the bottom person. The person on top is just there to help out. And then you could progress it till eventually maybe you're going for a you know guard passing sweep and passing battle right where mm -hmm. i'm trying to pass on top and you're trying to sweep and you can work your way up to that and again even with the sweeping and passing battles you then have a limited range of possibilities where you know again if a person's playing a guard position during a full roll if they mess up what happens they get smashed afterwards but now we're saying, hey, if you mess up, he's going to pass. And then afterwards, you just go right back to the same position and we're going to do it again. And you get mm -hmm. plenty of chances to actually try things out under those live conditions and get accustomed to that stress and that resistance in that position. And so it's super important. So, again, creating those ways to basically like a little like a step, it's just stepping up the intensity slowly but surely. Yeah. If you look at uh, let's talk about weightlifting again, you watch mm -hmm. someone weightlift, say they're doing a maybe um, a deadlift or a squat, anything like that. And you watch them do the same exact, their technique looks exactly the same under each, you know, as the weight increases, they don't fluctuate. Eventually. They don't round. Yes. And that's how, you know, you've reached your limit, right? But so eventually, gonna, yeah. Cause eventually they get under a certain load and, and they the start to round breaks. or yes. Exactly. Yeah, and that's how, you know, okay, you've reached the end of your resistance. Yes. You can't, yeah. You know, 
it's cool to see like elite level lifters like do they look exactly the same as the way as the plates go up yep. they look exactly the same in their movement pattern um and that's kind of i think like that's how you start to develop your you might be able to hit that technique in a certain level of resistance that could be um resistance could be belt rank right it could be like a purple belt you can hit this technique against a purple belt but maybe not a brown belt and and that that's how you know okay i need to refine it a little bit more but that's that's also when you learn like if you're developing a new technique like all right i'm gonna work this technique or places where i'm not or positions or techniques i'm not as good at against lower belts right and i'm gonna keep working that and then i know when I, if i go against an upper belt that's got my number i may not go for that thing it might not be the best idea because i don't get smashed and be on bottom and then smash for the rest of the round um so that's another way like you may say all right to challenge myself a little more to get more out of training i'm going to focus on this you know, half guard sweep against up to purple belt or an opponent that I know that I'm going to be able to at least get in there and get some effective work in versus, you know, it's not as clean and I'm going to get smashed. So that's kind of where the skill level and then the intensity and all that stuff can kind of play. And I think it can be helpful. I mean, I think that's kind of what I do because if I roll with someone that's like a white belt or a blue belt, and I know I'm much better than them. Me doing my same techniques that are really effective. I'm not getting anything out of that role and they're not either. You know, I have to kind of play around and do different, not, not play per se, but I have to experiment and do different things where even if I do get in trouble, I know maybe I won't be smashed for the rest of the round. I'll be able to get back out and try again. Yeah. And yeah, and I, there is a time to just focus on your best stuff. Um, Absolutely. because obviously there, again, the studies show that there's not really, a we don't have a ceiling for like your, your, your motor patterns, right? So like even people that have performed movements patterns that they have done for years and years and years and years, they still show some improvement with continued practice. Now, again, it's going to be a slow improvement because at a certain point, the, you get to a point of super diminishing returns, right? Where you're putting in a lot of work and you're getting very little back because you've gotten so much better at it, but you still get something. And there's times where let's say if you're getting ready for a competition, you shouldn't be doing a whole lot of new stuff. You should be focused on the, your best stuff so that you can improve the timing of those techniques, right? Again, being making sure that your body is wired to be looking for these specific things, right? Because again, the way that I think about it, it's almost like um, it's like playing a video game. And, you know, like let's say you're playing like an RPG style game, right? When you go into the the fight of the game, you typically have to equip your character with certain weapons and skills and and different things, right? Well, you're when you're rolling, you're typically only going to rely on a handful of things. Maybe you know, may, I don't know the number, maybe a dozen techniques and positions and things like that all combined. And so, when you're drilling your repetitions and getting your techniques in and working on your stuff that's what's going to be sort of in the forefront of your body's or your brain and and uh, and right off the sort of the feeling of with your muscles so when you're rolling you're going to look for that stuff yeah. and so when you're getting ready to compete you should make sure that like the the stuff that you're working on is the stuff that should be your best stuff the stuff that you can use the best the stuff that you know is uh, your best positions, your most effective techniques, your most effective submissions. This way, when you go compete, that's the stuff you're going to be looking for. Because again, if you're, let's say that you're really good at guard passing, but for the last two months, you've been spending all of your time doing daily Heva sweeps. Well, when it comes time to the competition, I mean, you might be able to do daily Heva sweep, but your guard passing is not going to feel as sharp. Yeah, you know, and so again, you want to sort of equip yourself accordingly for the for what you need to during periods where there's no competition coming up and you want to develop your game. That's when you experiment more, play around with stuff more uh, during periods where you're getting ready for something and you need to be as sharp as possible. Your game should typically become smaller. It should become very focused on this little hand, like, you know, dozen techniques or whatever that you're going to use for this competition. It's your takedowns, your guard passes, sweeps, submissions, things like that. Chewie, how much stock do you put into solo drills for maybe? And, and now we can talk about solo drills in a little bit more expansive way because I think there is a place for solo drills in certain sure. capacities. Um, for me as a physical therapist and when I work on rehabbing and getting people back to jujitsu, I think solo drills are very important to create like – movement capacity the ability yep. to like okay if i need to get inverted or if i need to close guard make sure my hip or my knee can do what it needs to do adequate mm -hmm. for the movement so i think it's very important for that 
as far as techniques go, how much stock do you put in solo drills? As far as techniques go, not much. I mean, I think, like you said, the 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 benefit of solo drills is increasing the capacity of movement, um, increasing the abilities uh, of the body to do related jiu-jitsu movements effectively. Um, it can be great for developing cardio um, mm -hmm. that transfers to jiu-jitsu because you're doing you're using lots of different muscles in the same way that you would when you're training. Um, I, like for here's a here's a great example. I remember the first time I really came across solo drills in any real form um, was with one of my old coaches, Hanato. Hanato showed some solo drills, and we went through them as kind of a warm up for one of the seminars. And so, I thought it was pretty neat, and I started doing them a lot because I was like, well, let's just play around with them. It was something fun. At the time I was teaching full time at Jiu Jitsu. So um, <laughs> back then I didn't really know what to do business wise. And so I just used to work out a lot. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll throw in a solo drill session every morning before my first class. And so I would solo drill. Well, what I noticed was that a, maybe about a month after I started doing my, like my solo drill sessions, like three times a week or whatever it was, I remember rolling with my black belt coach, Kyle, and I remember him putting me like the thing that always messed me up with Kyle is we would get into all these weird positions where I just didn't know what to do. Right. That's really what happened. And then what happened was, is I noticed all of a sudden from moving and sort of working in these weird positions from solo drills and basically improvising sometimes with them. All of a sudden, I'm doing better improvising when I'm moving around on the mats because my movement capacity is better. I feel more comfortable moving in different positions that I didn't normally get to. And so I think that's like the the benefit of it is like to increase your ability to movement. Now, think about this. Jiu-Jitsu is movement, right? Mm -hmm. That's all it is, right? So if your movement capacity is better, if you can move around more effectively without getting tired, if, you're, um, if your joints are looser, if your hips and muscles are looser, that can be an incredible benefit to your jiu-jitsu game, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I, I yep. like it for that. Now, for a specific technique, I mean, there could be something maybe like when you're doing certain things, like maybe if you're doing a solo drill, like on a heavy bag and you're doing leg swings for an arm bar or something like that. But at the end of the day, you got to have a training partner. If you're not doing yep. it on a body, it's just not going to work. But you can do things that I think could help support those techniques, but they're not going to replace the techniques. You could do things that could help you more readily be more readily able to absorb the technical information because your body's already used to being in these particular positions kind of from the solo drills, but it's ultimately, you're still going to have to do them on a body. I do think that. So, so I would say as a, as a physical therapist, I would say I'm kind of a movement connoisseur. If you'll, if you'll think of it <laughs> that way, I like to learn movement modalities. So I ended up one weekend, there was like going to be a course called animal flow in, in Louisville. And I was like, okay, I had never really had much interest in it, but I was like, let me try this. And it's like all about quadrupedal. So we're moving on hands and feet, basically four point contact, four point movement, crawling different ways. I was like, let me see what this can do. And I realized that like, first of all, it's fatiguing and it, it it's hard to do. And there's a lot of uh, build building up capacity to do the movements, but also like I was developing because there's some hand balancing going on. Yep body awareness i was mm -hmm. starting to learn how to kind of balance my body on my hands and like in some of these awkward positions and i think it uh it, it i'm still playing with i'm still new into it but i'm like doing these things like i feel that there's some benefit to where maybe i'm getting ready to get swept and i end up kind of upside down or something am i going to be able to correct or to paint change my body's position while i'm in that maybe balancing on my hands to kind of not get hurt or to end up in a position maybe that's that's more advantageous to me. So that's something that um, I don't know, like I'm still playing around with that. And I'm wondering like if there's anything you've done outside of jujitsu that's maybe been helpful for you. I think that's something like I do a lot of those movement type stuff and like the the crawling, maybe a little hand balancing and different type of things. Um, is there anything you've done you feel like has helped maybe your jujitsu indirectly or directly? Sure. I mean, like lifting. Lifting's yeah, great for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's simple, but like lifting's been great. It's helped uh, prevent injuries and help keep me strong. Um, yep. Yoga and mm -hmm. doing different stretching uh, techniques has been really useful. Yeah. I noticed, um, like during the the lockdowns, I couldn't train as much. Again, I wasn't locked down for as long as some of you guys. We were close for about a month, 
but it was long enough to where I wasn't on the mats for a while. So I, I basically did yoga every day. And I noticed that when I came back, I had better guard retention because my hip mobility was better, hmm. right? Like I could, I could, cause a lot of times I would do basically do the stretch where you're laying on your back and you're bringing your knee up to your chest and you're essentially like just moving it around in, in a motion. And like, I remember that got me much better about having my knees to my chest and being able to fight with my legs. And I noticed I had better mobility and better uh, flexibility in my legs. And so therefore, you know, again, with better flexibility in the legs, I was able to retain guard a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Or when someone was trying to smash past me, I was more comfortable in those positions. Uh, and so that's another thing. The solo drills that I did, like you said, like I, like I said, was useful for helping support me in during the roles and being in weird positions and not really knowing what I was supposed to do but just feeling things out with my body, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so those have been obviously some ideas, but uh, nothing that I think would be out of the ordinary. But then also too, there's like ideas, like for instance, from this is how my brain works because I've done jujitsu so long, everything kind of comes back to it. When I ride horses, I there's all kinds of random things. I'm like, oh, this is kind of like jujitsu. You know, like this idea of um, when you ride a horse, if I put pressure on the horse this way with my leg, if I start to press into my leg, it puts pressure on the side of the horse and the horse will move away from the pressure. And then once they move away from the pressure, you then let up off of them to let them, again, you're doing what I want you to do, right? Well, in jiu-jitsu, we do the same thing because I was thinking about this. Like, what do we do in jiu-jitsu a lot of times? We apply pressure to someone in a way mm -hmm. where what do they do? They want to move away from the pressure. And then as they do, we're like, yeah, go this. Like, for instance, like a lot of the back takes I set up, a lot of times I put pressure in a way where it makes it really hard for them to turn towards me, but they can easily turn away from me. Yeah. And if they do, it's, it's like, go that direction because I want your back. So if you turn away from me, you're going to give me what I want. And so, yeah. again, there's all these ideas going on there. Yeah, I think like I was writing a, a kind of a list about like what what are some of the and this is not an exhaustive list. But, like what is like some of the ideas or some of the main concepts of what makes a black belt technique? Obviously, one is setups and grips, right? We talked about that. You got to have the proper setup. Then off balancing. You have off balancing through off balancing. You have timing. You have to have your timing to take advantage of that off balance. You have the reactions of your you know training partner. You have the um connection and tension right you push or you pull you connect to them or you push them away and expect a reaction and i think the final piece i was kind of thinking about it the final piece is like consistency of your technique under various level different conditions of you know intensity or environment it could be like well i'm really good in the gym because i'm comfortable in that environment but when i go to a yep. tournament the intensity is so high and i'm so nervous that i can't hit these techniques or i freeze so it's like that's kind of what black belt i feel like to me some of those key components of a black belt technique are um i don't know what are your thoughts i think all oh, that's good again but then it comes back to like if let's say if we was like a venn diagram and we got the little circles right uh -huh. yeah yeah the, the the circle that's in the middle is like the adaptations in their body yeah you know because again all the setups i you can know the setup you're not going to execute it if the adaptations have not taken place. If you haven't put yeah. the hours in, like right. for instance, like with the hand fighting and grip fighting time and reps. Well, yeah, exactly. Because I mean, like for instance, like with grip fighting, a lot of people, like if I talk to them, like this morning I was rolling with one of the blue belts and I was controlling his wrists. He just, just let me have control of his wrist and he's yep. trying to move around. And I was like, Hey, I was like, what should you be doing right now? I was like, uh, break these off. I'm like, yeah, but again, he wasn't thinking about it. Whereas like me, grip fighting is literally autopilot. I, I just do what I'm supposed to do because I've done it so much that I know what it feels like to do it correctly. And I know what it feels like to do it incorrectly. So when someone gets their hands on the inside of my body, I know, oop, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So I'm fighting that out. Right. And again, that will take precedent over everything else. Um, and then, like you said about the off balancing stuff, um, again, it's when you off balance someone, you typically have this moment of off balance, right? Because then they go back to balanced. Right. So you get them off balance, but they're only there for a moment. They're not sitting there staring at you, looking at you like, hey, I'm off balance. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. It's usually like a pop. They were just off balance for a yep. second. Like when we do the giggler to get the underhook. Right. We off balance them to get them to reach out. That exposes the underhook. We get the underhook, but they're only there for a second. Mm -hmm. And then you said about timing again. Timing is that where we see it and we've been there enough that we can then anticipate the next movement and the recognition of the opportunity to execute the technique is short, right? We get rid of that lag time because in the beginning, we've all been there before. You see what you should have done, but you were too slow to do it. 
Um, a lot of times when you come back from injuries, you see, this happens all the time. It's like you're you're moving in slow motion. You do something to someone. You're like, oh, I should have done that. Too late. But when you get good timing, when you build the timing up, it's like fast. As soon as you see it, you recognize it. Boom, you're pulling the trigger. And mm -hmm. typically, you'll know you have good timing with something when you're doing the thing. And it's like after it's already happening, you're thinking about it. Right. It's like it, you're not actually it's not a like mental like I'm X, Y, Z. It's like you're just doing it and it's happening. And then you're like, oh, shit, there it is. Look at that. Look at me. Do, uh, I'm uh, There's literally moments in competitions where I'm rolling and competing and I'm doing something and I literally feel like I'm along for the ride. Like my my brain is actively working, of course, but then my body's just going. And I'm I remember like I remember one time doing um, a technique and I was literally I won the match with it. And I was like, oh, hey, look at that. And it just happened and <laughs> as the, as I'm rolling, I'm thinking, Hey man, that was pretty cool. And so you see that sometimes, or you'll feel that and experience it sometimes. And to me, that's how, you know, you got good timing where I'm not even thinking about it. The moment the, the body positioned itself, I felt the physical cue and boom, I went right. And so again, I, you know, I think there's a lot of factors into it. And I think all those that you said are correct. I think again, it just, it's just understanding that all those things take time to develop and when we say develop i mean developing them in the body to the point where they're automatic and you've pushed mm -hmm. what used to be something that required a lot of thought has now been pushed into automaticity and it does not require any thought you're just you're doing it that's the magic and that's the magic of jujitsu where when your coach rolls with you and your coach just feels you move slightly off center and boom he sweeps you you know or basically you do this and she chokes you out right whatever it's just like they they notice that one thing that only comes from those hours and hours and hours of training and so again my um i i say this because i know that there is a movement in like i see it in the ads the advertisements in jiu-jitsu you know i get targeted for them and it's like hey guys my name's so-and-so. If you'd like to learn my secret training system about how I did this and this in 24 months, then pick it up. I'm like, look, man, like, you know, it, <laughs> like it was, I was talking to Brandon mm -hmm. and uh, my student for you guys that know Brandon, he's a, you know, three-time NAI champion. He's an, a stud athlete and he's a hell of a worker, right? He has that perfect combination of being talented and willing to work really hard. And I was talking to him. I was like, if he ever wins something really big, you know, like within the next year or so, I'm just going to be like, Hey guys, would you like to learn the secret about how I took this guy? And I, you know, in only two years, I took him from this to this. We'll leave out all the stuff about the fact that he was a NAI champion, that he is a college athlete. Da, 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 da. No, no, no. You don't have to do any of that. Just, just follow my proven system. It's all, it's all hogwash because obviously here's the deal guys. If there was a system that we could just crank out people left and right with like it, it, where we just knew it was going to work we would be then someone would be doing it but nobody is i mean you have some gyms that crank out a lot of really good guys mm -hmm. but not everybody that goes into that gym is going to make it to that level right not everybody right. that goes into atos becomes a world champion not everybody that goes and trains with gordon ryan and john donaher becomes a world champion right but again a lot of people get very good because there are there's a good coaching staff there but there's no magic system there's systems and there's things and you got to find a coach that can that connects with you and you like the way that they show you things and you can learn from them but ultimately then it comes down to the work and uh so again i guess that's my uh, my rant there is just making sure that you understand no matter what you're doing what no matter what you're learning at the end of the day, you have to execute, right? You can collect all these ideas. You can collect all these cool techniques and positions. But at the end of the day, it comes down to your ability to execute. You have to execute. You take one thing, you do it over and over again, and you execute on it. Like Hodger talked about in another interview. He's one of the best in the world. He has maybe five techniques he's mastered. Everything else he knows, five techniques he's mastered. All right. So again, one of the best guys in the world. And that's what he says. So again, you find something that feels pretty good that works for you. And you just go down the rabbit hole with that thing and you try to master it. It's not the most exciting road. It's not necessarily the most fun road, but it's the road where it's most often the most fruitful one. Um, so just an idea to chew on there. All right, guys. So hopefully you enjoyed the podcast today. Uh, got something from it. If you're a coach, hopefully something works uh, related to you. I know that I, when I this was based off of one of my emails, I sent that out and actually got a couple messages from coaches saying, hey, man, thanks for getting me back on track. Sometimes I find myself 
wanting to teach too many things. So you know, it's always good to share that. Um, but again, hopefully you guys enjoyed the podcast. Uh, big thanks to our sponsors, Charlotte's Web CBD. You can check them out at charlottesweb.com. You know, again, any of you guys, and we know we have a lot of you that are over 30, the more you train, the more you realize that recovery is an important thing. And any sort of supplement or little technique that you can do is, is useful. Uh, obviously, sleep, diet, you know, those things are incredibly uh, important. I mean, those are the biggies, right? When my sleep and my diet are good, everything pretty much runs better. Uh, but there are supplements and there are things that I like to do for recovery. Uh, I do have an ice tub. I use the ice tub about three days a week on my rolling days. I don't do it on my lifting days. Um, I do take some supplements, things like um, there's a the Jocko. They've got a sleep supplement that I like yeah. um, that doesn't have any melatonin in it. And I also take some ashwagandha root at about 300 milligrams per day. Uh, both of those I take at night. And then one of the other supplements that I take is the CBD supplement. And again, it's it's useful for helping support sl uh, healthy sleep cycles and manage stress. And so it's one of the uh, supplements that I throw into the mix. And so, again, if recovery is something that you guys are trying to give a boost for your training and for everything else, check out Charlotte's Web. You can get everything from tinctures like the eyedroppers to gummies and balms that you can rub on your body and everything else. They also have a new line of stuff with THC-free versions as well as uh, CBD supplements that come with um, nutritional supplements inside of them, things to help you focus or to for relaxation, that kind of thing. Um, and to save 20% on any of their items, if you're interested, you can go to their website at charlottesweb.com and the promo code is jujitsu20 for 20% off. Also, thanks to Matt at Epic Roll. EpicRollBJJ.com is the website. Uh, again, they just released a new type of short, uh, MMA or excuse me, Nogi short. So again, if you guys have tried their shorts before, I really like them. They are Velcro-less. They don't have the, sh the Velcro strap on it. So you don't have that bulky flap in the front. And also, too, you don't have a situation where the shorts wear out because the Velcro goes out, right? Mm -hmm. And they just released a new pair, Matt, um, released a shorter cut shorter inseam which is something that i i like right i like shorter shorts a little bit and i find them more comfortable during rolling and so if you guys want to check those out you can go to their website at epicrollbjj.com the grappling short 2.0 is on there you can check that out and that's their new short that they have so if you guys want to check that out um give it a try and uh if you want to save some money on it use the promo code chujitsu c-h-e-w-j-i-t-s-u for 15 percent off and if you guys would like to support the podcast directly, you can do so by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. And again, when you guys go there and sign up, you'll get an ad-free version of this podcast if you'd like it. And then also, too, you'll get access to an exclusive library that has content such as seminars that I've recorded, warm-up routines and that help with flexibility and mobility that Eugene's recorded with all his physical therapy knowledge. And also, too, you'll get an access to an exclusive library that has a little snippet from each one of the guests that we've had on the podcast, all these different black belts, doctors, and everything else, giving you some specific tangible idea that you can take to your training the next time you're you know, in the gym or whatever it might be. And if you'd like to get access to it, you can do so by going to our website at patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast. And last but not least, guys, if you'd like to get my daily email, which again, this podcast was based on and many of the podcasts are, which has everything from philosophical rants to the books that I'm reading to links to the books that I'm reading. Um, I even put in there the other day, I was sharing um, everything, all the sleep supplements and gadgets that I use when I'm traveling. Uh, to just because again, when you're traveling, sometimes it's easy to get your sleep screwed up. So it's uh, my little hacks and stuff that I've put mm -hmm. in for not really hacks, but just the little ideas that I put into place for making sure I get good sleep when I'm traveling because I've been doing a lot of seminars and traveling this year. And again, all that stuff and more, you can get it at jujitsu.net slash join J O I N. And again, when you join up, you'll get access to my daily email and uh, you can unsubscribe at any time. So guys, thank you so much for joining us this week and uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.